on this. Well, perfect. Well, first of all, um, hi everyone, and uh, a big thank you to to the family and uh, Nicola as well for having me um, to moderate the debate uh, tonight. I think Nicola and I are going to have a bit of a conversation uh, up here for about 30, 40 minutes, but then I really also want to turn it around and have your questions and have you engaged in in the conversation. Um, one of the things Hugo did share that we we used to share the same office space. I can also vouch for the excellent. Um, cooking skills of the family because they would regularly um, uh, be so good that they turn on the fire alarm in the entire building so that just everyone is aware that the family was hosting one of their famous, famous dinners. Um, before we get into discussion, maybe just a quick plug of I think also why, uh, why, why we at Stripe were, were very excited to, uh, to be able to host a debate is that we're a company of, of book lovers. In, uh, in fact, we have started our own publishing house um, because our, our leadership team and our CEO particularly is, is in love with books. I think that states that is there as a statement. He thinks it's an underused form of making an argument and he believes that you need a couple of pages to really get into why you think an idea is worth, is worth debating. And I think that's what we're looking forward to today. Um, in our f very first office, our meeting rooms were named after um, his favorite academic articles. Um, it quickly turned out that it wasn't very practical if you name a room, uh, you know, the impacts of uh, cholera on uh, the Latin American economies in the 1700s. It was only referred to as cholera, it was difficult. So we settled on um, animals, actually, and animal names for meeting rooms. Um, but enough, uh, enough about Stripe and to the reason why we're here today. And is Nicola and his book Hedge. Um, maybe to check wh who has read, say, parts of the book um, already. I know I will be tested um, on whether I have, so. <laughs> but maybe to, maybe to start off uh, the discussion, can you tell us why you wrote the book in the first place and what impact you hope you will have by putting forward the ideas? Um, and then we can get into the ideas on later on. Well, yes, uh, th thank you, first of all, for attending this event. Um, and thank you, Sandro, for uh, having the discussion with me today. Um, actually, the, this book is at the crossroads of two topics that are very uh, dear to me, uh, that I'm very involved in, uh, that are uh, the safety net or social policy in general, and entrepreneurship, which is the core business of the family, obviously. Um, so it it, w it could sound far-fetched to, to join the two topics in the same book or in the same discussion, but in fact what's been happening for many years now is it's, it's that entrepreneurs have had a hard time uh, dealing with the hostility that uh, society as a whole expresses when it comes to tech company disrupting the existing order. Uh, it's something that, we've, uh, that we are very used to in Europe, entrepreneurs having a hard time uh, overcoming regulatory obstacles, having in incumbents against them, trying to destroy them because startups uh, solve problems, but they also hurt many established interests. Um, and so, and they usually don't fit in the box. And so when there's no box uh, to welcome the startups, then it means that you have to invent new rules. And to invent new rules, you need um, progressive politicians that are willing to do what it takes to discuss, to understand what go what's going on with the current shift, and, and to, to come up with new paradigms, and finally to, to implement new rules. And so we, we don't really have that in Europe. Uh, you don't really, uh, they don't really have that in the U.S., but in the U.S. for a very long time they've, be, they've been dealing with that problem by throwing money at the problem, like paying armies of lawyers and PR people and comms people to take care of all the problems that were arising in the field of policy. Uh, and that made it possible for Silicon Valley startups to keep on going and keep on growing and building their product and addressing the market uh, without being slowed down by the, compl the complex world of policy. What, we, what we've been doing in Europe is very different. We don't have the luxury of raising as much cash when you're tech startups uh, starting operations, plus 
Uh, Europe is a very fragmented uh, market. It doesn't really exist as a single market. So when you're an, an entrepreneur in Europe, you have to start in one country before you expand in other countries. And with each country comes uh, come a, a, a new series of problems that are somehow related to the local governments, the local rules and local regulations and so on. And so to deal with that, we as the family have been designing a playbook. And the playbook, there's a secret at the heart of that playbook, which is that when people see startups as the enemy, you should change the conversation from startups are hurting society with their new things to policymakers are hurting society by failing to design and implement the new rules, the new regulations, the new institutions that startups call for. Um, we, we so were, it's been, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah we ahead. were chatting about this before and I was, I was intrigued by it because essentially what you're then saying to a policymaker is the solution to the problem that you have is to create more of the problem in, in, yes. in ways that you need more innovation and more startups to have this bigger conversation that you think should be, should be happening. Yes, yeah, so th there's, um, there's a framework that, that, that is widely used in the tech industry because it's, uh, it's liked by venture capitalists, uh, which is Carlota Perez's framework. So she's an economist. She wrote a book, um, almost 15 years ago called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital. And it's a book that explains how um, a, a new, what she calls a new techno-economic paradigm uh, replaces the old techno-economic techno paradigm every 50 to 70 years. And with the new paradigm call, uh, come new institutions, a new way of creating value and ultimately a new way of life. And if the way of life changes, as, the, as a result of a new, new technologies emerging, then that means you need to change many things, uh, uh, including in the, in the policy world. And so, so we're currently going through such a paradigm shift or technological revolution. We're, we're, start, we're just starting to understand what the new techno-economic paradigm is about. Uh, and you have two options. Either you try to resist it and to slow it down, and the end result, I think, is that you end up a less developed country with less wealth to be redistributed to the population, or you embrace the new paradigm. But it's frightening, as you mentioned, because it means that on top of the new problems that startups are bringing about, you will create even more problems around all the, 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 the por around the polarization that, that comes with um, designing new institutions. Because if you say, well, we have to reinvent ev everything, there'll be a lot of players entering the stage, entering the scene to try to, to grab uh, what's, to be, what's to be grabbed and to, to take what's to be taken here uh, and, and try to have the new institutions designed to their advantage. And so as policymakers, they have a very hard job to do, which is to decide the direction in which, and the values which, which ultimately those institutions will embody. Uh, and maybe to pick up on that, I, you know, I think one of the interesting things is that you, in the book, is that you really ask, you don't ask just the big questions yourself, but you mm -hmm. force others to think about the big questions rather than move from sort of one crisis to another mm -hmm. or one debate in the digital policy realm to another. And, you know, given we're in, in Berlin uh, tonight and in Germany, which is, uh, you know, known as a country or used to be and hopefully still is known as a country yeah. of inventors, yeah. whether it's the washing machine, the x-ray, the MP3, uh, but Germany also invented the original safety net, um, as you put out in the book. It was under Chancellor Bismarck that the idea of sort of a commonly solved safety net for society was there, but it felt and I, I read up on it again today on sort of the, the history and how it came about. It was, all, it was very reactive of things that were happening. And it was Bismarck trying to say, okay, I need to prove to the people that the state is actually providing something good for them. And it was, it was a big moment in history, but you're arguing that we might be at one of these big moments in history again, where the old institutions that have been around, I mean, essentially we're still debating the back and forth of that safety net and how big it should be. And in the book you say, you know, I was trying to flip forward to, well, who's going to bring this change about? And you say, probably China, but we might not like it. 
probably not the US because of Trump. Europe doesn't have the economic power in that segment to do it, so your hope or part of your hope is on the companies themselves. And I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit on maybe the companies bit or, or one of the others if, if you want to, because I think one of the interesting thoughts I would get from you, I would like to get from you is where to start, um, given it's such a broad and big debate, where do you think this change needs to start to happen and who drives it um, uh, if, you, if we think back to Bismarck reacting to something rather than acting on something that he came up with? Well, yes, I, I'm a big believer in the principle of action and reaction. I think you need to act first. Uh, if, uh, if you count on, on the people opposite you uh, uh, to, to react. And so Bismarck reacted to a certain pressure, which was that of the labor movement. I mean, there were workers who left the countryside to join the new industrial concerns that existed at the time. And we, in those new industries, uh, work was very hard. So it, it was about suffering, low wages, terrible conditions, ex terrible management. Uh, and of course, the, you, the employers were not interested in providing workers with benefits, uh, security, and so on, because they only saw le uh, workers as you know, an army of, of, of a commodity that could be used uh, as, as they please. So, so Bismarck saw that and he realized that the labor movement had the power to overthrow the entire uh, institutional system. So throw down the German state, destroy the factories, crush uh, Germany's nascent economic power, which was terrible to him. So he decided to act upon, to react to that pressure and to provide those workers and the movement they were uh, actually organizing with the new institutions that they demanded, with the immediate consequence of curbing down the influence of socialists and communists uh, over the German workforce. And so I think we're, ex we're precisely in, in, in a similar paradigm shift at the moment. You can see that by realizing that a lot of people are unsatisfied with what they have. They think that they have a bad job, that uh, they're working t too hard in very bad conditions for not enough money. They think that uh, they're confronted with many problems that, uh, that don't have a solution, like uh, real estate is more and more expensive, which leads people to having problems finding uh, affordable housing in large cities where all the jobs tend to concentrate. Uh, and so people are angry, and because they're angry, they don't have good jobs, they don't have enough purchasing power, they don't have economic security. They're trying to focus on uh, other things like Islam or immigrants or um, anything that resembles a, a threat from the outside. And, and, and so I think it's very telling that, that uh, uh, we're currently going through that shift and precisely at that moment tho those problems appear, people are turning to populist uh, political forces, uh, quasi-fascists are rising in, in certain countries, uh, rising in power, and so it's very dangerous and we need a Bismarck to react to that state of things and to come up with the institutions that will appease the demand for radical action and actually provide people with what they demand, which is again, good jobs, economic security, a high enough purchasing power. When people have that, they're content and democracy can flourish. And would you, would you see that Bismarck being a CEO of either an existing or a yet growing tech company or mm. to be a prime minister of, uh, of a European nation. I mean, just today, I don't know whether people saw it, um, mm. Amazon um, uh, came out with um, the fact that they're going to raise mm. the minimum wages of, of mm. all, I think, all of their employees to, to $15. I mean, clearly, a Jeff Bezos has a power to shift the narrative in a way that maybe um, a prime minister can't. Are you seeing, when you think of the new Bismarcks that, you know, that are going to react... Mm. Do you see companies or governments in the driving seat? Well, for one thing, I, th I think tech companies have a, an interest in that kind of thing happening. 
they need those institutions to be in place because it will make it easier for them to do more business and ultimately to create more jobs and to make more profits. Uh, if people see you as, as see your company as a threat, you always go against many obstacles and, and, and problems that will make it more difficult to do business. And I think that many tech companies, especially US tech companies, are experiencing that in Europe as of today. Um, so it's in their interest, that's a, that's a first thing. The other thing is that we're used to the idea that the state will come up with a solution because it's exactly what happened the last time. The, 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 the US federal government came up with the New Deal in reaction to the Great Depression and its terrible impact on the US as a country. Uh, and then European governments came up with building all, the, all the institutions following World War II and the complete destruction of the European economy. Uh, and and they, they did that because they said, well, the tension between the labor movement and, and, and the business world led to the rise of fascism, mm. and we don't want to, to live through that again in Europe. We need security and shared prosperity if we want to avoid a similar fate in the future. And so we're used to that idea of the state solving the problems, but it's because the last time the state was the, the most powerful player in the room, and only the state had the power to force the companies to, to, to embrace those new institutions, ultimately in their interest. Today, I'm not sure that the state has either the willingness or the power to do that. So to, to, you went through the list. So yeah. European governments are quite weak as compared to tech companies. They don't really have the power and influence to force tech companies to, to contribute to, to, to that effort at imagining and, and deploying those new institutions. Mm -hmm. And so it may be in the interest of those companies if they're not invited to do it by a government. Uh, so far, they seem like they're not doing it. And European governments are not only uh, weak in terms of size, they're also less legitimate because we don't have large tech companies in, here in Europe. Uh, and so we see those tech companies as foreign and our governments tend to regulate them, code word, as foreign companies uh, with protectionist um, with protectionist ideas in mind. Well, they're the evil Americans trying to conquer our local market in Europe. And so we'll do what it takes to protect our consumers and our workers from those companies that are inflicting new models on our social contract. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had local tech companies, there, we would have a different conversation between the policy-making world and the tech world because local tech, tech CEO would, would have dinner with ministers and explain to them that, no, well, yes, we, you need to regulate the tech industry, but uh, you also need those companies to flourish because some of them are local companies, which is not the case yet. So European governments have a distorted view of the tech industry because it's seen as a purely American phenomenon or Chinese. The, 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 the American government, uh, as opposed to what happened when, under Obama, doesn't have the willingness to build a new saf safety net. It's simply not what the Republicans stand for. Um, China, I think, will go there because, uh, because they're lacking democratic institutions. So the only way for people to express their anger and dissatisfaction in China is to destroy everything. Uh, um, and, so, and the Chinese government is very much aware of that and they want to make sure that people are provided with what they demand, which is again good jobs, purchasing power, economic security, a certain comfort uh, in their day-to-day -day life. And so ultimately they will need to build that safety net yeah. to provide people with that so that people don't throw the government out, so if down, uh, sorry. And so finally, um, the Chinese version of the safety net may not be attractive for us Westerners because it won't involve uh, 
liberal democratic values. Mm. Uh, we can't expect anything from the US government, also I think. We can't expect much from European governments, and so I think that tech companies need to take the matter into their own hands and work harder at convincing everyone, including policymakers, that we really need to act on that. If we, if we continue on that premise, and let, let's sort of take that argument and, mm. and, and go one step further and think about the kinds of pressures, as you described them, mm. that, that are there or are not there for tech companies to realize and, and start acting in that mm. way. One of the arguments you make in the book that I think th that stood out to me was that, you know, the relationship to the consumer or the role of the individual is something mm. that you put very central as in this is something that has fundamentally changed from how the world used to be to the entrepreneurial age we live in. And mm. that sort of the individual both provides, uh, sort of provides data and input into the business models of these companies, mm. but there is a, a relentless customer centricity and focus on serving an individual mm. that previous companies and industries didn't have to worry about. Is, do you think the pressure, because in, in, in Germany and in Europe, too often, this, or often the discussion is based on, you know, we need to protect the consumer from company X, Y, and Z. Mm. Do you see that power imbalance being the other way around? And do you see that increased pressure will come either from users or individuals and we see the, you know, the unionization of, for example, in the gig economy and mm. delivery drivers starting to, um, uh, to negotiate um, uh, and, and think about what a union movement could, could be mm. for them. Do you think that is needed, that kind of pressure is needed to convince tech companies to act in a different way and what if you could talk a little bit about this role of the individual and the consumer, because yeah. I think it's a quite interesting part in, in your book. Well, yes, I, I think the first step is to understand what the digital economy or what I call the entrepreneurial age are about. And there's, there are very, very simple principles that explain the radical difference between today's economy, a more digital economy, and what the economy used to be in the 20th century, dominated by those Fordist corporations in traditional industries. I think that in the past, the most powerful companies were those who concentrated power on the inside. They had the most assets, more employees, uh, longer distribution uh, routes, um, more valuable brands, and everything was on the inside of the organization, either employees or assets. Uh, and so, as the institutions that we created at that time were designed to, 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 to compensate for the power of the most dominant companies of the time. And so, the, the institutions were designed to, to counterbalance that power that was concentrated on, on, on the inside. And so, for instance, uh, so, so, so the institutions orchestrated a kind of pressure so from unions on the workers' side and from consumers through antitrust and other policies on the consumer side. Today, uh, companies are very different, and the reason is that the, the current technological revolution can be summed up in one sentence. Basically, it has moved power, it's been moving power from the inside to the outside of organizations. And that's because we individuals are now equipped with increasing uh, computing power. We all have devices that are so powerful that we, we basically exert power uh, of our own. Plus, that power is pooled at the scale of, of very large networks because we're all connected to one another through the internet and because we're using the same applications um, the, uh, with network effects embedded in applications. And so we have power as individuals and the companies that are the most powerful in that new world where individuals, connected individuals are powerful are the companies that have learned to harness the power of individuals and invite individuals into their value chain. And so at the heart of every tech company's business model, you'll find that particular feature that consists in attracting the power of individuals and bringing it inside so that it generates profits for the company. Like Google is collecting data 
uh, when we use its search engine. Or uh, Facebook is based, Facebook entire, Facebook's entire business model is based on us, on our sharing content on the platform. Or Amazon is collecting reviews and data to, to, to train their um, recommendation engine. And so uh, those companies are winning because they've learned the difficult art of harnessing the power that we users uh, retain. And so based on that, we, we, we have to realize that the new institutions that we need to build should account for this unprecedented power of individuals outside of organizations. Yeah. And, and so, for instance, uh, people say, well, users need to be empowered against tech companies because they are collecting so much data and so on. But users are already empowered. And so the more you empower users, the more you empower the tech companies that, that is uh, harnessing the user's power. Yeah. And maybe you need to empower the workers because the users are, um, are mostly consumers. They demand cheaper prices. They demand shorter delays. Yeah. Uh, they demand a, a constantly uh, higher quality. Um, and so, and they're exerting, exerting that pressure that tech companies are all too happy to, to respond to by coming up with more entrepreneurial uh, a more entrepreneurial approach to solving their problems. Like, I have a product that's cheaper, better, faster than the competition. I, I, and so the pressure is on the workers now. And, and, and we need to take care of the workers before we, we take care of the consumers. Yeah, I think that, that as a thesis, um, you know, I, I remember someone telling me, you know, what's the most important thing that people always disagree with you with? I would, I would think that that um, that argument of you actually saying that um, consumers are empowered already. I, I think most policymakers, particularly in Germany, but across Europe, I think see the world or see it through a very different paradigm. Um, and I think this notion of that somehow because, you know, we are all watching, uh, watching Netflix in the evening, somehow that increases the pressure of the Netflix CEO to think about the, the greater social safety net and really worry about the well-being of the person that watches Netflix in the evening and make sure that he can continue to watch Netflix in the evening because he has job security and a safety net that is fit for it. I think that's quite a, I think that's quite a stretch for, for most policymakers to realize. Um, and I wonder in your conversations that you've been having to unpack, you know, when you unpack that argument, do you see a shift in, in perception? Um, and, and, and do you think that policymakers will realize that actually rather than consumers being sort of the victims of companies um, that we as collective consumers quite, have quite a lot of bargaining power. It might just be a matter of how do we organize it and how do we assert that influence um, to have the companies think about the bigger picture. Well, I'm not actually sure it's in the interest of the consumers f uh, for those companies to, to invest more in the safety net because the more you invest in the safety net, the, the, uh, over the short term it will make the products uh, more expensive and of a lesser quality because it's basically paying more for your workers and their security. And today, the, the economy can really be seen as the consumers pitted against the workers and the consumers winning because they're, they're the ones able to use computing and networks freely, whereas workers are, are constrained by the firms that employ them. And, and they cannot organize as, as if efficiently. Plus, they're less numer numerous than, than the consumers. And so when it comes to network effects, it's always the largest networks network that, that wins in the end. So I'm not sure the, the solution will come from the individuals as consumers. But it will come at some point from the workers realizing that now power is vested in consumers and then trying to build an alliance with the consumers and to try to try to attract their attention of how hard it is to be a worker in the digital economy because you consumers are so impatient and so willing to pay cheaper prices uh, and, and it's too much pr pressure on us the workers so maybe uh, workers will will work will manage to organize a new kind of unions that will 
we will be focused on reaching out to consumers mm. and turning them into allies. It, it has me thinking about, you know, every Christmas, and I don't know whether mm. this is a, a, a specific to Germany, but, you know, as the weather is getting colder, um, mm. I'm starting to think about Christmas. Maybe I'm the only one. Um, but, it, you know, the, there always is the, the threat of a, of a strike, um, thinking about Amazon or whether it's a DHL. And, and, you know, they try. I think they're starting to see that mm. consumers are only seeing the product as it is and want the product to be cheaper and quicker and faster, mm. but there is less of a realization of the kind of work that goes on behind it. Mm. And I wonder whether what forms that could take where it's a bit more constructive rather than just, you know, I'll stop delivering um, uh, your food to your house within 10 hours. Uh, are you seeing, do you have an example of where workers within these companies and maybe it's uh, within European companies to get to your point that there might be a different kind of discussion in Europe if some of these were European, where you see that alliance working? Do you have a concrete example of, you know, he, th this led to a shift in, in how the company is thinking about these issues? Well, I, f I think it's very difficult and, and to, to come up with, so, with ready, we will turn key solutions. Um, uh, there's an entire part of the book that is dedicated to discuss discussing policy propositions, uh, how, how to solve certain problems like the tax system doesn't work as well as in the past, or uh, how to make housing more affordable for, more, for a more urban workforce. So there are uh, quite a few ideas in the book, but I think that the most important part of the book is sharing that idea of a new paradigm and what this new paradigm is about that is mostly the power of connected ind individuals. So in that sense, it's, um, I'm extremely uh, cautious when people ask me, so do you have a concrete example? Because I, I, I can come up with one, but it will be disappointing. You know, there's a huge problem here and a tiny example that su suggests that maybe there's a solution uh, that can be found over the long term. So, and the gap between the two is so frightening that I think it's better to refocus on what the new paradigm is about. And when everyone has finally understood that, then we can start working on solutions. That being said, uh, there, there's a lot happening in the world of freelancers, mm -hmm. so freelance workers. Um, I'm, I use the term entrepreneurial age to to sum up what the new age is about. I think it's about a more entrepreneurial economy. But a more entrepreneurial economy is not about everyone becoming an entrepreneur or a freelancer. It's about companies having to become more entrepreneurial if they want to survive. And you probably know that if you're employed by a more entrepreneurial company, the risks are higher that the company can go bust because it will take more risks or that, will, that it will change its business model frequently which will lead to certain workers leaving and other workers joining the company because a new business model calls for uh, different skills. And so a more entrepreneurial economy is an economy that is marked by widespread instability from a worker's perspective. And uh, to understand what the consequence of that kind of instability has for workers, we need to look at that particular segment of the workforce that, that are uh, freelancers. Not to say that we'll all mm. become freelancers in the we'll future. Become more like them yes, in the future. Yes, but the trends that are emerging in the freelancing world today are a good overview of what's waiting for us in a more, on a more entrepreneurial labor market. Would you include... And so th the gig economy in, in, in that as well, and sort of yes, sharing economy, exactly. you so, put it in a different so, bracket? No, no, that's the same. So, and, and precisely, you have very different situations in the freelancing world from the Uber driver who doesn't have much of a choice in terms of, how much, uh, in, in, in terms of pricing, scheduling, uh, the conditions uh, in which he will drive his car, their car, etc., uh, to the highly qualified engineer that is fed up with working for an IT service company and decides to become a freelancer and, and makes four times more money doing, uh, as a freelancer that he, than he used to, to do as a, as a wage worker. And so 
what those people have realized is that to make more money, I have to be identified as myself with my skills properly documented with a track record that is uh, accessible to, for my clients with references that that and former clients that are vouching for me and, ex, uh, and, and willing to, to say how good I am and how how good I, w I used to be uh, uh, solving their problems. Or a solid GitHub repository for people to look at. Absolutely. <laughs> to know what I, what or, I can do. Or a YouTube yeah. video if you're a musician. Or, well, you, you know the drill. And so, so I think those unions who will ultimately, eventually try to reach out to consumers to make the case for better working conditions and higher prices, will do that by showing the workers and revealing what their work is about and how skilled they are and mm -hmm. and how important their role is in the in this warehouse or in this car or in this hotel or wherever in the economy so uh, in the luxury industry it's actually a concept it's called value chain visibility mm -hmm. uh, it's because when you buy a luxury product you want to be certain that it's made uh, that it's been made by craftspeople uh, out of the the uh, out of top material. Uh, you want to know how the animals were raised before they were killed to 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 uh, to, to have the fur or, or the skin or whatever. You want to be sure that they were raised in good conditions, and it's critical for luxury brands to communicate on that. And I think in the future it will be the same for every company. Um, and uh, consumers may, may not be curious about how that product came to be, but workers will make, s will, will make it sure that consumers ask the, the hard questions so as to benefit as workers. One, and maybe to, to touch on, um, on the country where we're in tonight, uh, uh, which is Germany, and I think one of the arguments you touch on in the book and that is often made as well is that some of these economies that are um, maybe dominated or, or, or historically known for certain traditional industries, mm. that is, and that economic model still seems to work quite well if we look at mm. unemployment numbers, if, uh, uh, you know, if we look at any sort of measure of how the economy is doing, I think most people would agree that currently it's, it, it's working all right for Germany, but I think everyone, especially in this room and, 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 and who's thinking about these issues knows that these companies need to transform. They need to become, in your words, more entrepreneurial. Do you see, do you see a, a better chance of that happening in countries like Germany, where you do have these incumbent industries that do have the power um, uh, and the influence to sway whether it's public opinion, whether it's, as you say, the dinners with the ministers and the policymakers, yeah. or do you think it will be smaller companies that we yet don't even know about who are going to have these conversations and are going to have people listen to these conversations more? Um, I mean, do you expect a debate in, in, in sort of less developed economies to quicker to move to these kinds of debates and these results? And what do you think the chances are of, uh, of, of Germany in this, in this world that you described to be maybe one of these places where these discussions are being held? I mean, to the credit of, mm. uh, of the German government, they did release, uh, it was last year, a white paper on, on the future of work and did start a debate um, on these issues on freelance work and, and the gig economy? Um, well, I'm a bit of a pessimist here because I think that fi things ultimately move in the right direction if there are powerful economic interests behind uh, uh, in building those institutions. Um, the history of, Ford, uh, of the Fordist economy is that one day Henry Ford was fed up with the high turnover of his employees. He had to hire too many employees, train them, and then they left because the conditions were too hard. And so he decided to retain them by raising wages a lot. And what he discovered, and so he, he expected to lose a lot of money on that, well, to, to have a hit on his margin. Yeah. And what he discovered is that, no, the hit didn't exist because what he lost in terms of higher wages was compensated for 10 times by the higher productivity that well-paid employees were able to generate. 
And so that's the secret that that was discovered by the corporate world at the time is that if you pay people more, they're more productive and ultimately everyone benefits and, and a fraction of this added value can be distracted to pay for social benefits, higher wages, more jobs, a higher quality, lower prices. It, it, it's a whole system. So today, uh, we're still waiting for that Henry Ford of the uh, uh, of the 21st century, the, the, the tech CEO that will realize that uh, providing workers with that safety net is ultimately in the, in the benefit of the tech industry as a whole. And then the tech industry will move forward pressuring the governments to make sure that it happens. Uh, whereas old companies traditional companies, including uh, innovative ones like the German companies, I think they still have uh, more, more to lose than to gain in that redistribution of power. And I, so we need, a, we need a Ford and we need a, a Bismarck. Unfortunately, we're, we're mostly talking about men uh, and, and not about women here. So that leads me to, to ask a question on, um, I think on diversity and the role that that plays in the kinds of social safety net that we're talking about because if you're let's assume your, your your theory of the pressure is going to come from these new companies that are being built um, and the kinds of systems and they are if they're really the ones that are going to create the institutions that we all rely on in the future there's recently both this week a report came out by the Albright Foundation in Germany that showed an absolutely dismal numbers um, of female representation in the strategic level in German industry uh, I think the same holds true, unfortunately, for the for the startup economy. One numbers that they showed is that there was more, the three most frequent male names, I think it was Thomas, Frank, and Michael, are better represented in uh, the higher level of the German boards than females in general. What, how are you, I mean, if, if these companies are creating the next uh, safety net, are, are you worried about the lack of, diversity of the kinds of people that are building these companies um, and, and how are you thinking about what kind of people ultimately start these companies and start pressuring them and, and does diversity factor in to that equation? Well, um, it's a very good question and um, I think, well, again, if you revisit the history of the safety net in the past, especially in the 19th century, you realize that uh, most of it wasn't built by Bismarck's. Uh, it was, most of the safety net at the time was actually built on the ground by people who, who experienced the problems and who came together as unions or as co-ops or as um, with various forms of organization, workers from the same factory or farmers from the same area coming together to solve their own problems. And they didn't really count on the government to do that because they were doing that at a small scale. But there was a very entrepreneurial approach in those people uh, tackling the problems that they had and coming up with uh, um, solutions that be effectively became part of the safety net. So I think that today we're, we're still waiting for or, or we're already seeing maybe in the startup world, all those entrepreneurs who are actually spotting the problems and trying to solve them at a small scale using technology. Mm -hmm. um, that this is, by the way, another reason why the, why the world of freelancers is interesting is because freelancers need a safety net like everyone else. But that safety net is actually built one brick at a time by startups I providing know. services to freelancers, yeah. like insurance, uh, housing, uh, consumer finance, and so on. And so you, you can spot small versions of mm. the safety net of the future by spotting, by observing startups that are active in, in, uh, in those different markets, like ha again, housing, consumer finance, insurance, and, and a few others. Um, the problem, as you mentioned, is that too few uh, women are actually founding startups. So this is where uh, organizations like the family uh, play, have a role to play. It's because we're trying to 
to, to, to provide opportunities to many more people in terms of founding startups. We don't think that you need to be a man to, to found a startup, but we, we, we think that there are many obstacles that explain why to, uh, uh, so few w women are actually entering that world. So we need to work harder at providing uh, women who are actually experiencing those problems or spotting them uh, have a good idea uh, of how to use technology to solve those problems so that they'll be able to to, to, to enter the world of startups and, and, and contribute with small-scale solutions, maybe large-scale at some point. Another reason why I think women are very important in that shift is that what about the jobs of, your, of the future? A large part of the anger and worrying that exists today is due to the fact that people see the good jobs of yesterday disappearing one after another. And the reason, so it's a bit compl it's a bit lo it's a bit long, but the reason why those jobs are disappearing is that in the past the jobs that were easier to integrate in the real realm of scientific management were those that were mostly about routine tasks. Mm -hmm. And so, if your job consisted in executing routine tasks, then you could be employed by a large corporation ruled by scientific management. And those large corporations were so powerful and so productive and so dominant and so rich that they could pay you a high wage and provide you with social benefits. And so we saw those jobs as the best jobs you, can, you could have. Joining a, an assembly line, a factory, or working in a large bureaucracy uh, in a, um, a desk job, basically. But today, all those jobs, because they were pre-automated by scientific management, are the, are the first to disappear due to automation. Those workers who used to have good jobs are the first to be replaced by software and robots or other forms of automation. And so what we're left with are the bad jobs. Jobs in personal care, hospitality, hotels, restaurants, um, childcare, uh, urban logistics, and those are bad jobs because no one uh, never took care of those people. And, and if you look at those jobs more closely, you'll realize that most of them are, um, uh, are about immigrants or people from minorities or women. Mm. And the reason why uh, there's a majority of women uh, working in what I call proximity services is precisely because the lousy jobs, jobs that the men didn't want in the 20th century. And uh, women took them because, uh, uh, well, their, their, their husband ha had a good job in a large Fordist organization, and so they could uh, just take a lousy job on the side to complement uh, the household's income. Today, if you announce to those workers, those men in, in the majority, that good news, you've lost your job in the factory uh, over there, but there are a lot of many jobs waiting for you in the city where you can become a, a nanny or a nurse or a, a driver on Uber or a waiter at a restaurant. They'll be terrified because they don't see those jobs as proper jobs. And so what we need to do is to turn those jobs into good jobs by building the institutions that will eventually turn this segment of the workforce into the new middle class. This is really what the new safety net is about. And obviously, because those jobs are in their majority occupied by women, women have a key role to play here. Yeah. Organizing, yeah. providing, uh, coming up with solutions, um, deploying the infrastructure that will turn those jobs into better jobs. Uh, and so we have to empower them to do that. Are you, I mean, and maybe we, we, we almost come back to, to the theme that you, you started with in the beginning where you did describe, you know, some of the worrying political trends that we're seeing, some of the sort of far-right populist surges across Europe um, with sort of seemingly easy solution to these worries that you're describing of, of jobs being lost. A lot of, you know, if we, I understand that the freelance discussion is just one example and you think it's interesting because um, it, it's you start to see a kind of safety net that you're envisaging or describing in the book to emerge. Are you worried that because so much of that is, 
is focused on, on high-tech and high-skilled jobs. And if we think freelance, I think we're probably more often think about the, the software engineer that has skills that are so desired in the market that he can work from, from wherever and not the Uber driver. How are you thinking of sort of a city versus rural split? And I think if you look at where some of the votes are coming from um, for some of the big, um, for, for these political parties, they do come more from rural areas. Mm. How do you see that being reconciled or, or that discussion maybe moving to a place where it is also you know, an opportune discussion to be had in, in, in the rural areas and not just focused on, on cities um, where we all know Amazon Fresh, Deliveroo, and Uber sort of readily available for us? I, I think that the new jobs and the new economy in general is, is being invented in cities. And the reason is that cities are clusters uh, which concentrate many, many res resources and assets that you need to, um, to, to trigger job creation, value creation, uh, companies growing and so on and so working with entrepreneurs all day long you need you you know that there are far more entrepreneurs in cities because there's you know the competition and the emulation that, that is going on and 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 the, the ease, it's easier to access resources in cities and so um, what happened the last time is that the first factories were, were also in cities and all the workers on the countryside didn't want to go to the cities and yeah. have those jo these jobs. Yeah. They didn't want those jobs because they were lousy and in cities. Yeah. And so this is the reason why those jobs were usually filled by immigrants. Again, uh, I mean, in the US, it was all about the Italians, the Germans, the Irish, mm. the Poles who were the, the industrial workforce that led to the US being that dominant power in the Fordist economy. And uh, in Europe, it was exactly the same. And it's only much later when those jobs became good jobs that the locals started con considering them. And so you need that first wave of uh, workers willing to endure everything and to do what it takes because they really need that income and those opportunities. And this is why immigrants are so critical, even if they're low skilled, it's because they're the ones willing to consider those jobs of the future when they're, they're not as good uh, as we could expect. And then filling them, uh, they, make, they make it possible for us to understand what those jobs are really about and to finally uh, build the institutions that will turn them into good jobs. And so I think, um, so it's normal that the, the, that the rural areas are against that new economy. It's because they have everything to lose. Uh, but it's only a matter of time when, fi when we finally grow those companies and create those many jobs in proximity services and those jobs bec eventually become good jobs, then uh, not only will the cities become more attractive for those living outside cities, but also will start to see the spreading of those um, businesses and jobs beyond cities, like happened uh, in the Fordist economy. So it's a matter of time, which doesn't solve anything, because we're yeah. in, 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 in the meantime, the we're, we're stuck with the, with the populism and the tensions and the polarizing. But I, I think it's precisely the reason why we need strong, progressive, forward-looking leadership. And if we can't expect that from the policy-making world in the first place, then we need an extra nudge from the part of the tech industry. And we're des desperately waiting for that one, but I'm sure, including with this book, uh, it, it can it can finally arrive, and maybe that's the perfect segue to turn uh, to turn the, the the microphone around uh, to you all, um, and also to thank you for for the discussion. Um, and. And thanks for bearing with us uh, while, we, while we went through so many of the themes. And it wasn't even, uh, you know, we couldn't touch on everything that was in the book. So I urge you, little pluck, you know, uh, if you found some of that stuff interesting, do go back and, uh, and read it. But now I want to turn it 
over to questions from the audience. Um, and I think hopefully there are some of the entrepreneurs or policymakers in the audience that have good ideas uh, for us to talk about questions for Nicolas. Um, and I'll turn it over to That was Go, great first question. Questions. Mm, hello. So thank you for your precious insights and I will definitely reach out to your book and uh, look into some answers. And uh, you mentioned the topic of work to zero and the gig economy, so the role of freelancers in increasing uh, in the economy. Uh, and also mentioned uh, the way how big companies concentrate the power, how they concentrate the capital, how they concentrate the value of people's data, uh, just um, data which people give away freely uh, online. And I was just wondering if decentralized organizations could be a part of a solution where people who are collaborate, collaborators or contributors, also in the form of free freelancers, uh, who also get some kind of influence in the decision making and not only uh, participate in the financial results. And what would be the legal challenges or policy challenges regarding decentralized organizations? Thank you. Calls for another book, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, um, I'm a believer in, in the power of decentralized organizations. Uh, in the book, I, um, I, I wrote several pages around the question of what, what's the future of trade unions. And I explained in the book that in the future, trade unions um, should be more about exit than about voice. So in the traditional Albert Hishman's framework of uh, voice, exit and loyalty. And so uh, the idea is very simple. Simple. It's that in the past, workers were settlers. You found a job and you embraced an industry and, and, and in many cases an employer with which you would stick for years, even decades. And so you were settling in that job for a very long time. And unions were designed to 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 defend your interests as a settler. So based on the assumption that you, you wanted to, to stay there. And so uh, what really mattered was that your situation, your, your condition improved where you were. So it was really about voicing your concerns with low wages, bad working conditions, and counting on the employer to provide you with higher wages and better benefits and, and make, making it possible for you to stay, to, to, to keep on settling. Uh, in the future, or even today, I think that with the economy becoming more entrepreneurial, uh, the, 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 the time for settling is over. And we have to be prepared as individuals to be more of hunters in the economy. We have to be ready to switch jobs more often and to even switch industries or switch cities because we again we we need to be to become more of hunters uh, 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 ready to 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 learn new skills and to seize new opportunities wherever or, or in whatever industries there are and so in that context of hunting becoming the norm as opposed to settling Unions are irrelevant if their goal is to protect you in your current job. Uh, they become rele relevant if they help you uh, hunting rather than settling. And so, I, and so I, uh, those pages are about what I call exit unions, that is organizations that are here to help workers um, leave, leave a company and find opportunities elsewhere. And I think that, well, if one worker does that, it's not much, and you don't really have bargaining power. I'm leaving, uh, e either you pay me more or I'm leaving. Well, your employer will probably say, well, go leave and good luck with your next job. But if at the same time, all the workers in a single company or in, in the single factory, for instance, decide to bargain and threaten to leave because their unions has organized them moving to a different city, 
finding a job in a different industry, training them so that they learn the new skills, providing them with uh, the buffer and, 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 and the support they need while moving. You need to find a new house, you need your spouse to, to come along, obviously, and find a new job. So it's, it's very complicated to switch career today. P uh, too many politicians assume that it's only about learning new skills, but it's more than that. It's a, in many cases, it's moving from one place to another. It's bringing your entire family with you, finding a new school for the kids, finding a new job for, a new job for your spouse, etc. This is why I think that exit unions will be a part of the solution. They will deploy large infrastructures to, to support their members during those transitions that will become more and more fre frequent in the economy. And I think that, so this is a long answer to your question, but I think that decentralized organizations, um, when the, the technology becomes more mature and more efficient, I think those nascent exit unions will be among the first to try to harness it and to, to deploy those infrastructures to support their members. And I, I expect that, that to be quite an effective way of bargaining with employers. And I, and I think interesting about this, that at the same time it could uh, solve sort of the discussion or solve, help solve the discussion around digital skills and retraining and governments trying to figure out the best way uh, to move the workforce from one way to another. Um, no. Anyway, uh, how much time do we have for questions? Just checking in. We'll go. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you guys are still good, we're still good. Oh, okay. It's me. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Freelancer speaking. So uh, my question is regarding the proximity jobs. That uh, what you said that it's better to make them be more prestigious, so more people would be uh, maybe even inspired, challenged to to have them in case, for instance, these traditional organizations shut down some uh, job uh, positions, right, the, that are not relevant to the market. But when this happens, there is also a huge gap between the amount of people skilled to um, more skilled jobs, like, uh, for instance, at the moment we lack people in data science, artificial intelligence sectors, and so on, but uh, they, uh, not many people know about the perspectives, uh, about um, the, um, uh, the benefits of these positions, because in their minds um, it's not... Uh, the, the people uh, didn't shift their understanding what is a cool job. Uh, some people would, for instance, uh, think that working for a bank or big, large organization, it, it was the best thing to do, right? So do you believe that um, this is also something that needs to be actually communicated, not only shifting to popularization of proximity jobs, making people just actually, because these proximity jobs, they maybe they make people happy, maybe more relaxed and so on, though even it's like a busy life, right? But it's not a highly skilled, like people when they have high education and then have these kind of jobs, it means it doesn't really match their um, skills? Well, I, I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to all the discourse around high, skilled, uh, high skills and going back to school. To um, I think a, a significant, significant, significant part of the center-left, both in Europe and in the US, have relied on that discourse for much of the 90s. Uh, explaining to people, yes, you're about to lose your job in the old, dying uh, f uh, industrial economy, but good news, you'll go back to university and you'll be trained as an engineer or designer or developer or, or software um, uh, person, and, and, and then you'll find a new job in this booming part of the economy that is the tech industry. And I think that people never really believed that, but after 20 years, they really don't believe that. That is, it really didn't work, and, 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 and I think we, we, we've, come to, we've come to the point where uh, the political discourse on high skills is, is frightening for the majority of the electorate. Uh, I think when people hear high skills, they hear, I'm not concerned, that's not for me. That, that may work for my son, or f 
for my cousin who's smarter and willing to do what it takes to learn new things. But I'm too old, I'm too stuck where, uh, in my small town. Uh, I'm too dependent. Uh, uh, um, uh, I, I don't have the, the, the energy to, 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 learn, uh, to learn new skills, especially if they're high skills. And so, so I think it's been counterproductive, to, to sum it up, uh, to insist so much on high skills. We, we need to realize that not everyone is looking for, uh, for high skills. Uh, there are many needs in the economy that won't be met by high-skilled workers, but low-skilled workers. I'm not even sure is high, uh, that high versus low is the right framework here because uh, especially in an economy where, where everyone will have to reinvent it themselves uh, many times, like engineers bec uh, becoming craft beer uh, brewers or, or we, it's, it's very, it's, the, it's a tiny minor minority but in France we're seeing a lot of office workers, highly qualified, making a lot of money in finance, consulting, and, and they're fed up with their life and they, they can't stand it anymore. And they, they work too hard, they don't see their kids, and so they decide to become craftspeople or, or shop, shop owners or, or craft, craft beer brewers. Uh, and, and so again, it's, it's a small fraction of the workforce, but it reveals a trend that is that the separation between high skills and low skills that used to be the norm in Fordist organizations maybe won't exist, won't be as important in the future. And so we, I think we have to unlearn that and uh, above all, we have to s stop talking about that in front of the voters because voters can't stand it anymore. And that I'm sure of. There was a very interesting episode during the presidential campaign in France where Macron went to a factory that was about to close and all the angry workers were surrounding him, very physically threatening him with, you, you need to do what it takes so that the factory remains open. He was quite courageous and actually convinced a lot of um, undecided voters uh, at that precise moment because he, stand f he stood firm and told them that no, I don't have the power to, to keep that factory open, but what I promise you is that you'll go back to, to, to school and you'll learn new skills, and they almost, they almost hit him uh, hearing that because they said, we've been hearing that for 20 years, it never worked. None of us here who's lost their job in the area has found a new job following them being trained by the job agency, etc. So I think we have to slow down on that idea, uh, unlearn the idea that there's a strict separation between high, skill, high skills and low skills, and um, discuss the, the job market with a fresh view, fresher view. I'm surprised, I, I sort of, every time, um, uh, you know, I, I, or there's something on Deliveroo, or if I'm, I'm using a Lyft ride, I, I you know, I, I'm curious about how they've, uh, it's obviously very sort of selective and, and, and only sort of subjective, but the amount of time someone tells me, well, it's because I couldn't deal with shitty bosses and management anymore. And, you know, I just, I mean, for them, at least most of them I talked to at, at that time and, and of what they had done before and what they do now, it didn't seem like a low quality job. I mean, all the things that they were annoyed by that they were used to were not there anymore. Um, uh, and it has me believe, I think, on your thesis of those are people that are skilled. They've had, uh, you know, they've had careers. Um, they know what it takes and maybe they, they also know what it takes to change the working environment and the things that they don't like about their job now uh, going forward. That's because in the past, the, ba the, the bad boss and, uh, and the terrible management and the hard working conditions were compensated for with a high wage and economic security and social benefits. And all those don't exist anymore because the pressure is so hard in the corporate world. Uh, companies has, have been so uh, going so hard against, against their own employees uh, trying to make their operations more efficient and, and less costly that it's, it's actually become very hard to, to work in that world. And so the people say, well, 
what do I gain in exchange for all the suffering? Not, not much, so I'm, I prefer to leave and uh, recover my freedom to drive wh whenever I want and to d discuss with nice people back in the car. Let's see if there's, if there's more questions also. I, I'm sure we're, I think there's sort of two, three, two in the front, but I'm also sure we're still around um, uh, for picking up conversations later. So maybe we take the two together, if that works, and see if they match, and if not, we'll just have two questions to answer. Sure, hi, I'm, I'm Daniel, and thanks for the discussion. It was, it was really interesting. Um, you talked about um, the need for employees to become hunters as opposed to settlers. My question is, uh, so what does this mean for policymakers? Because, you know, if you look at the political system in the US compared to Europe, it seems to me that um, institutions play a much bigger role in Europe than they do in the US. Um, and if you have like incumbent organizations in Europe which have dominated the policy discourse over the last decades, it's unions, it's employer organizations, it's large political parties, and they have doing quite well um, for their own kind of political careers uh, when they just promise more protection and you know just shielded people from this change that is coming anyway. Um, and this is different in the US, uh, I think, at least so far. And maybe there's also a coincidence that it was Macron, I mean, I'm not at all an expert on French politics, but maybe it's not a coincidence that Macron, who kind of attacked the old cohabitation, I think is the, is the, is the, the name, um, who also made France much more visible as a startup nation. So the question is, do we also not have to have a more kind of entrepreneurial political scene in order to kind of have a you know, proper political environment for this change that you are talking about? Um, so I'm going to choose a, a question that at least tries to fit a little bit. Um, uh, you're talking a, a little bit about who is going to bring this change. Is it China, is it the US, or is it Europe? And one of the interesting things, um, I feel, is this idea that it's going to be invented somewhere and then spread elsewhere. Um, but in the meantime, I feel that there is a parallel conversation around free trade. There was this new renegotiation um, of NAFTA uh, today or yesterday. And a lot of people, uh, economists, are talking about how free trade has become something that goes too much into imposing the same preferences to everyone and how we should try to make free trade a little bit more about, well, in France, you know, we'd like to have these environmental regulations and it's not about, uh, we can maybe have different um, arrangements, right? And so I would like to see a little bit how you think about the particularities or how the variations maybe of those different, um, of this new safety net and how you would envision it. So I think, do we need more entrepreneurial politicians and can there be different safety nets um, locally? So, um, so yes, I think we definitely need a new political class to manage that transition. Uh, uh, obviously, many political leaders in the recent past have not been at the bar when it comes to understanding what was going on, uh, coming up with, uh, let alone coming up with solutions. Um, so, again, the, the, so in the book, there are quite a few pages about Obama, and uh, Obama, for me, was one of the two Western leaders that actually matched the expectations in terms of uh, being interested in all that, being willing to understand the new world and being willing to work hard, including with the industry to, to, work, to build the new institutions. The other one was Ca Cameron in the, in the UK, uh, because you may remember that he came to power promising what he called a big society, and the big society was the state renouncing certain missions in favor of um, of civil society, but civil society, uh, the idea, uh, the, the, another idea was that civil society would harness the power of technology to actually solve problems that were previously without a solution. So, and Obama did, uh, did a lot of things. So he, uh, first he, he reformed the healthcare system by providing Americans with an almost universal uh, healthcare coverage, which which is critical in an entrepreneurial economy, you need people to be able to hop from job to job, while being while while being certain that they have coverage. 
So what Obama implemented was very much in line with the shift to a more entrepreneurial economy. Also, he was very close to Silicon Valley and uh, uh, got a lot of inspiration from his dinners in golf, uh, playing with Eric Schmidt and other, and Patrick Collison as well. Um, uh, well, tech CEOs who actually b became his friends, and when you, uh, they're your friends, uh, well, y you can interact with them in, um, with more trust and more attention, uh, trying to understand the new world. So we had those two leaders, uh, Cameron and Obama. They all, they both left at about the same time in similar circumstances. Uh, one because of Brexit, the other because, well, he had to leave, but he failed um, uh, passing the torch to, to, to a, de a democratic successor. And so we had Trump instead. And so the two efforts, both in the UK and the US, have failed. And, and what those two have built is effectively lost uh, in space because of the, the, the turn of events. And so now people are turning uh, toward Macron. So um, we're, we're very much supporters of Macron as the family. We've, uh, several of us have been vocal during the campaign supporting him. We really think he was the best option for the entrepreneurial world. Uh, Macron could be seen as a new Roosevelt. So if you know your history, you know that Roosevelt came to power in 1932 in the US following the Great Depression. Uh, and then he did the New Deal, and the New Deal was that extraordinary progressive achievement that provided workers with uh, security and, 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 and powerful unions. But in 1932, he didn't, didn't announce such things. He's, he had no program except for uh, bold experimentation and balancing the federal budget. That's, about what, his, that's what his campaign was about. And he only did the New Deal because under the pressure of, uh, well, the Supreme Court, who ruined, ruined uh, the, the first version of the New Deal, which, were, which was about controlling prices and wages, uh, the pressure of the left wing of the Democratic Party, uh, with, with some prominent leaders threatening to challenge him in the primary if he didn't, didn't take care of the workers. And all of that led to, oh, I'll give you the New Deal if that's what you want. But he wasn't convinced in the first place. He, he became convinced uh, by the pressure of, um, uh, by, the, by um, events and the circumstances. So Macron came to power very much like Roosevelt, very centrist, very pragmatic, not committed to any ideology in particular. And you could expect him, you could expect that maybe under the pressure and in very harsh circumstances, he will realize that uh, technocratic measures are not enough. I need to do a radical change, a radical upgrade of the safety net so that the safety net provides people with the security they need in a more entrepreneurial economy. It's not happening yet. We're confident it may happen in the future, but we'll have to work hard behind the scenes uh, to make that happen. And, and your help will, will be greatly appreciated. So if you write in international media, you can, write, you can be harsh on Macron and, and, and explain how, how much you, 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 you count on him for uh, uh, building such things. So as for the second question, which, uh, yes, the. I, I think it's true that, uh, well, the safety net in the past, I, I, I call it the great safety net because I want to stress the importance of the safety net being more than one institution. It's not only social insurance, it's also consumer finance, it's also powerful unions, and all that together combined forms the great safety net. Uh, and for uh, just between you and me, I didn't want to use welfare state because it contains the world state which makes it certain that you won't be listened to by people in Silicon Valley. So I had to deal with the, that minimalistic concept of the safety net and to counter the minimalistic uh, connotation I added great before that. So it's a great safety net. And the great safety net, there was a great safety net 1.0 that 
used to be modeled, uh, that used to have the same model in every country. But there were many differences in the way, for instance, healthcare coverage was provided. It's very different from the UK to France to Germany to the Netherlands to Sweden to the US. The US has by far the worst system. Uh, the UK used to have an extraordinary system that is going through quite a lot of difficulties at the moment. The French system is not that bad after all um, because it's mixed. There's a private sector that is very important and strong and but also a public um, uh, uh, layer that is ex that is critical to make it work. So I expect that in the future you could have a great safety net 2.0 that could be adapted at the margin depending on the local circumstances. But also because we we're, in, a, we're uh, in an economy connected by networks, you can expect the safety net being different not from one country to another but maybe from one constituency to another because workers in different sectors, in different industries or with different set of, sets of values will have different, very different needs and very different expectations uh, regarding the safety net. But they, they will also be able to connect with one another uh, across borders. And so that's a concept uh, going back to distributed infrastructure or decentralized infrastructure. It's the concept of cloud communities that I'm borrowing from uh, Balaji uh, Srinivasan, who's now the CEO of Coinbase, so very much into crypto. And he says that he wrote an article in Wired in 2013, fascinating article about software reorgan reorganizing the world, software making it possible for people to connect with one another, even though they're, they're at, a, at a very long distance. And so you can imagine in the future people deploying their own safety net using uh, decentralized infrastructure um, uh, across borders, like uh, a part of the community will be in the US, another part will be in Africa, the third part will be in Europe, and all those people will share the same safety net because it's the version they like. And, but it's too early to say, anyway. Uh, we, we have to observe if the states will remain as powerful and, cent and central as they were in the past, or if they will uh, leave the stage in favor of cities or cloud-based communities or other forms of collective organizing that will eventually lead to building a new safety net. I'll try yeah, to yeah. make it very quick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. No. It's it's really interesting stuff. And my name's um, Jody Gannon. I'm the vice president of the Irish Business Network of Germany, and I'm the CEO of a small company called the Big B Animation Company here in Berlin. And I'm born in Ireland, and I live in Sweden, and I work in Germany. And I'm a long-term uh, freelancer and small business owner um, from a decision I made when I was a teenager, actually. And it was self-willed. It was the way that I wanted to go. Now, when you've got up on your screen there, anyone can become an entrepreneur, I always feel that it needs to have a little qualifier with it in terms of if you have the guts to do it. And we're talking tonight about, about a safety net in particular, which is, is very interesting. And, but in my experience, there is none. There are many benefits to being a freelancer, to working freelance, and to being an entrepreneur. But you have no access to any safety whatsoever. You are taking full risk all the time. So I just would like to clarify, is my question really, just to clarify in tonight's discussion, um, how in the future, now that global corporations, and I know this is happening in IKEA, for example, in Sweden for the first time ever, where they are bringing people in on contract basis and as freelancers for the first time ever, and this is a major change for the whole Swedish ethic, so it's causing some disturbance. Um, people are being 
in a way, it's great to become an entrepreneur, it's great to be a freelancer, but I always feel if that's what you want to do. But people are now in the modern age, they're being forced into it. Yeah. And I wonder also in terms of, of, sorry, I thought I'd be quick, and now I go on a little bit, but it's very, very interesting. But when you go back to Bismarck and providing people with, with a nice environment and to keep them safe and secure, to me, everything that is safe and secure about society is based on the majority of people knowing when their holiday is and making sure that's secure so they can plan for that the rest of the year. And if you're freelance, you just do not have this. You don't have any of this. Mm. So how is that reconciled? <laughs> Sorry to, to go the long way around. <laughs> That'd be quick. But, but between, so the safety net versus the modern day people, mm. people working as freelancers. Thank you. So yes, so maybe two, two things. First, we have a lot of questions uh, on that baseline, which exists in the family for, uh, which has existed for five, uh, since we founded the firm five years ago. So anyone can become an entrepreneur doesn't mean that everyone can become an entrepreneur. That, that means that uh, entrepreneurs come from unexpected places. And you, you, you need to, to be free from any assumption as to, or prejudice as to what an entrepreneur is, what the background should be, or what the training, etc., etc. You have to be ready to consider uh, um, unexpected people coming up with the, the des desire to found a startup, and and that's a key part of our job. And so we were really proud of stressing the, that idea: anyone can become an entrepreneur. And it's not because you don't have the right degrees or you come you don't come from the right city that you can't have your chance founding your startup so that's one thing as for the other thing i mentioned the idea of settling versus hunting in the past the norm was settling and settling was about finding a steady job in a stable industry and because it was a steady job in a stable industry you were, you had the virtual guarantee of having having that job for for life if you wanted to. Uh, settling uh, was not aligned with everyone's mindset. There, was, there were people that were not at ease in a world of settlers. And so those people at the margin, the rebels like you, decided to become more of entrepreneurs, business owners, freelancers. But they were really the ones refusing the norm that society had built at the center of, inst of its institutional framework. And, and, and to, to break apart from society in such a way, you need to be quite radical. So I think in today's population of freelancers and business owners, there's this culture of, I refuse any assistance. I don't want the state to mingle in my problems. I, I don't like paying taxes, and I don't need the benefits anyway. But today, if you announce to people, tomorrow you all be hunters, not by choice, but by necessity, because the economy becomes more entrepreneurial. Those people who used to be settlers and who, who will have to become more of hunters in the future, they still want the security, and they prefer, they prefer their job to be steady. And so if the job itself cannot provide for all of that, because the jobs will be more precarious due to the more entrepreneurial nature of the economy, then it's the safety net that should be here to compensate. If you have to switch jobs more often, then at the very least, in the, inter, uh, in the transitioning periods, you'll have a safety net uh, to, 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 to take care of you. And so this is why you attract people used to settling into the hunting world. You don't attract them by saying, hey, it's very hard, and when, when you fall down, you're, you're doomed, and it's the end, of, um, and, and, if you, and if you hurt, you can't afford proper care, um, and you, ha you have to, to take, take things in your own, own hands and be self-reliant. People are not really interested in that, I think. People want a, a good life, and, and you have to provide them with that, otherwise they'll, they'll throw the government uh, out, and well, well, they'll make the revolution. Well,
but that's the problem, and that's the problem we need to solve. It's that as a freelancer, you should have access to affordable care, even though you 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 don't you've lost your last client, and you need a period during which you need to retrain, you need to meet new people, find new opportunities, maybe move to a new cities, learn new skills. Uh, why not? Uh, why shouldn't we expect the state or the city or uh, a cloud-based community using decentralized infrastructure or an exit union to provide you with that? Uh, if we don't have that, if, 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 it's a, uh, if it's all a jungle, then uh, with everyone, every man for itself, then um, the people who used to be at the margin as... as uh, um, Hardcore hunters will thrive in that economy, but all the other others will suffer a great deal and will ultimately vote for fascists uh, because the, that's where the anger leads uh, every one of us, basically. If we ever need a reminder to why um, thinking about and building the greater uh, safety net, I think it was your last sentence. I think in the interest of time, uh, I think we'll close here. We're around for, for questions. Sure, sure. I, I can uh, stick well, around. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Good luck on the lead.